With 43 survivors currently in DBD, there's a lot of lore for each to read through, but who wants to read? This series will discuss the survivor's lore and audiobook type form, so you can listen while doing some other task. This episode will be going over four survivors, Fang, David, Quentin, and Tap. Let's begin with... Fang Min was a young girl when she first picked up computer games, and she was instantly hooked. The brand new worlds enchanted her with colors, sounds, and explosions. A chance to be somewhere else, or someone else. Her parents saw now wrong with a few minutes in front of the screen, but as men's turned to hours and sometimes days, they finally decided to pull the plug and force Fang Min to put more effort into her studies. She felt smothered by her parents who refused to see the potential of a future in games, so she left home and spent her time in internet cafes and LAN parties where the old rules didn't apply. She spent hours playing, streaming, competing, to rise to the top. Her parents became what she called holiday parents, but she never saw them outside the holidays, and she became the black sheep of a one-child family. In the gaming world, however, she finally found respect. Nicknamed the Shining Lion, she was invited to join a prestigious esports team and to live in their dorms, where she found a sanctuary free of the misconceptions and prejudice she had felt from her parents and the non-gaming world. Fang Min pushed her limits to prove that she was the best. Sleep was less important to her than training. At the top of her game, she filled stadiums with fans who adored her, but it couldn't last forever. The pressure to be the best grew stronger and stronger. She pushed herself too far, slept too little, and her performance began to slip. She started to lose. At night, she would stay up, tormented by the thought of disappointing her parents and her fans. She spiraled out of control and fell into a pattern of self-destruction. She started wandering the streets and visiting bars, where no one knew of esports, waking up in places she didn't remember. One day, she woke up somewhere completely different, in a never-ending nightmare. Feng Min did not despair. She learned more about the challenge she was up against. She realized this is what she had been training for her entire life. Now, she was going to win. The single child of a wealthy family, David King seemed destined for greatness. While growing up in Manchester, he demonstrated serious potential in both sports and academics, and with his family connections, all doors were open to him. He could have succeeded at anything, if it weren't for his combative nature. David lived for the adrenaline rush of a good fight, and would go out of his way to get into one. His robustness and athletic abilities led him to rugby, where he could cut loose and really cause a ruckus. King excelled and gained a reputation as a promising, if somewhat reckless, rookie. His meteoric rise came to an abrupt end when he lost his temper and assaulted a referee, earning himself a lifetime ban from the league and cutting short what most people assumed was going to be a long, successful career. King was unconcerned. Money was no issue, so he took it as an early retirement and focused on other fun things to do. Free from the constraints of a career and enabled by the wealth of his family, David King spent most of his time at the pub, drinking, watching games, and getting into fights. Some might say he was wasting his life away. Not many people knew that he was an occasional debt collector, or that he fought in clandestine bare knuckle fight clubs. When David just stopped showing up at the pub, the few friends he still had were not surprised. They figured he had finally picked a fight with someone stronger than he was. In a way, they were right. King has this way of doing things that are quite amusing. One of my favorite memories I return to time and time again whenever I need a lift is Gasoline Man. King grabs this man who skipped a few payments on a loan. He drags him by the hair and throws him in an alley. He grabs a metal gasoline container and douses the sod with its contents and lights a match. He stares at him through the flickering flame as the man screams in terror. He watches him beg for his life. Then he flings the match. The man's eyes pop out of his head as the flame hits his chest and falls to the floor with a sizzle. King tells him to make his payment, or next time, he'll use real gasoline. Brilliant. When he heard that Nancy's mother had disappeared, Quentin Smith knew instantly that their success had been short-lived. Although their plan had seemed to work flawlessly, Freddy Krueger had beaten death yet again, but Quentin wasn't about to give up. It may take many attempts, but he vowed that somehow, they had found a way to beat Freddy once and for all. If he didn't, it would only be a matter of time before Freddy would win and Nancy was lost. Someone like Quentin never attracted attention to the library, no matter how strange the text he requested. He devoured all the information he could find on shared dream worlds, lucid dreams, and methods to control the dream space. Forcing himself to stay awake via a steady diet of pills and energy drinks, he searched through dusty volumes, finding myths about demons that live in dreams, trapping their victims in limbo and feeding off their terror. He worked quickly as he knew that Freddy would soon be coming for him. It wasn't long before that moment arrived and Freddy began appearing in his dreams. He stayed at the periphery at first, taunting Quentin, seemingly hoping to tire him out. Using all that he had learned, Quentin was able to see the flaws in the dream, cracks where escape routes could be formed. He tested this skill carefully, not wanting to show his hand, hoping that it would give him some kind of advantage that he could use to defeat Freddy. Then, one night, he found himself in the familiar environment of Bad Ham Preschool. Freddy had tired of the taunting and finally decided to gut him. Quentin ran through the school, his quick eyes scanning for something useful in the maze of rooms. He found a can of paint thinner and quickly formulated a plan. 
Once the trap was set, he waited, acting as the lure to draw Fetty into the right position. And there he was, Klaus scraping on metal as he closed in for the kill. Quentin allowed himself to enjoy the surprise on Freddy's face as the corridor ignited and then he was away, running through the building, heading for the exit that he knew existed. If he harried Freddy, weakening him and escaping the dream, surely that would defeat him over time. Before his eyes, the cracks in the dream closed and escape route was blocked. He was in Freddy's secret room again, and there was nowhere to run. As Freddy closed in, a broad grin spreading across his ruined face. Quentin was consumed with the need to see this man finally obliterated. He wished it had been him, not his father, who threw the gas can that ended Kruger's life, that it had been him who cut Freddy's throat. Perhaps that desire would be enough. This was a realm of the mind, after all. He let it consume him, concentrating all the thoughts on wishing Freddy gone. His vision was obscured with roiling tendrils of fog, and when it cleared, he was somewhere else. In another dream? If so, it wasn't his. It felt cold and unfamiliar. A flickering drew his attention, and he realized he was by a campfire, and he wasn't alone. Other people were trapped here, too and they needed his help. Detective David Tapp was one of the good guys. His determination to see killers brought to justice and their victims avenged had led him through a long and respected career. When he first saw the details of the Jigsaw case, it seemed like many others. More grisly and macabre, sure, but just another lunatic with a penchant for the overtraumatic, who would soon be behind bars. A stroke of insight brought Tapp and his partner, Detective Steven Singh, to an abandoned mannequin factory, where they discovered Jigsaw's lair. They apprehended the man, but he managed to escape before being unmasked, slashing Tap's throat as he did so. Leaving his partner, Singh went in pursuit, but fell victim to a booby trap. Tap had failed to go by the book on this one occasion, entering the lair without a warrant, and it had resulted in a detective's death. He was discharged from the force and left with a ruined throat and crippling guilt. He channeled that guilt into an obsession. He would find the killer, stop the murders, vindicate himself, and avenge his friend and colleague. Following the evidence trail brought him to Dr. Lawrence Gordon, and he staked out the doctor's apartment, sure that he would find some evidence of guilt. Then, he saw a stranger at Gordon's window and heard gunshots. Tab confronted him and the man fled, with the pursuit leading to an industrial building. Tab's age caught up with him, a fight that he would have easily won in his younger days ended with Tab taking a bullet to the chest. Slumping to the floor, he only saw failure. He had failed his partner and the other victims. Whoever the killer was, Tab had been unable to stop him. More would die, and it would be his fault. He let the rage and guilt consume him and closed his eyes for the final time. Beneath him, the concrete floor softened. He dug his fingers into the ground, feeling dirt and leaves. Where his chest had been wet with blood, the shirt was now dry and the pain had gone. His eyes opened onto a dark sky and the jagged, searching fingers of branches. Screams echoed through the forest and a new determination filled him. His mind was clear for the first time in months. Victims needed to be avenged, killers thwarted. He didn't know what this place was, but he was still a cop and he always would be. He had a job to do. That's the end of this episode of Survivor Lore. See you next time and have a great day.